Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Theorists have long argued that a defining characteristic of modernity is if people stop believing in spirits, magic, and myths. If we stop believing in enchantment, we will then be modern. But enchantment in the world is by no means gone, as described so phenomenally in the book The Myth of Disenchantment, Magic, Modernity, and the Birth of the Human Sciences by Dr. Jason Josephson Storm from Williams College. Dr. Storm and I start off this wide-ranging conversation by defining enchantment. Then we discuss if we are modern or not, discuss modern forms of enchantment. Then we look backwards in time and explore trends in the global south, trends in Europe and the west, the enchantment practices of some of history's most famous scientists like Marie Curie, Isaac Newton, and Francis Bacon, each of whom were interested in different enchanted practices like seances, magic, mystical texts, or alchemy. We then explore the life of Aleister Crowley and his influence on modern-day enchantment. This conversation goes in a lot of directions. We discussed philosophy, anthropology, sociology, folklore, psychoanalysis, and religious studies, all of which Dr. Storm is very interested in. This is a rapid-fire conversation that merely scratches the surface of what can be found in Storm's book, which is out from the University of Chicago Press. Basically, my take is that Jason Josephson Storm is attempting to lead a revolution in the humanities and social sciences. Storm is Professor of Religion and Chair of Science and Technology Studies at Williams College in Massachusetts. He received his Ph.D. in Religious Studies from Stanford University in 2006 and has held visiting positions in the U.S., France, and Germany. He has three primary research foci, Japanese religions, which he wrote about in another book, European intellectual history, and theory more broadly. He spoke to me on the cusp of a research leave for the 2019-2020 school year, in which he will complete his next book. You can follow him on Twitter at ghost underscore image underscore. If you like this show, you can follow me on Twitter at classical underscore ideas or on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jason Josephson Storm on his book, The Myth of Disenchantment. Dr. Jason Josephson Storm, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a delight to be here. Well, I am delighted to have you. Um, so, first of all, just by looking at some of your work, your book, your bio, you are into so many academic fields and disciplines. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do every day and how you see your particular job? Yeah. Um, oh, those are kind of two different questions, but I'll push into them in a different way. So, in a basic way, um, I'm a prophet of liberal arts college, um, but I'm like a kind of crazy intense researcher, So, which is a little unusual for... <laughs> Um, what it, a lot of liberal arts college uh, professors. Um, but in a way, um, intellectually, I'm very much a kind of uh, vagabond or nomad or something like that. Um, I'm for, for kind of intellectually serious reasons, I'm anti-disciplinary. I think many of the disciplines have become kinds of silos that blockade off knowledge and communication from each other so that, you know, people are working on similar problems in, say, sociology and anthropology, but without realizing it because they're using different vocabularies or, you know, disciplines tend to police themselves um, by introducing lots of unnecessary jargon or things that you're supposed to say or not say or what have you. And I'm, I don't buy into any of that. That said, I'm trained as kind of an intellectual historian um, and with a, with a training in kind of philology and philosophy and um, focusing on issues like religion and on science. And then more specifically, already in graduate school, I kind of did this weird thing, which is I specialize in two geographies. Um, on the one hand, Japan, so I spent a lot of time, you know, doing language work and field work in Japan and then also Western Europe. Um, and in the same, particularly Germany and France, really France primarily, but then more recently Germany. Um, and so I kind of look at both of those areas in a period of time from roughly 1600 to the present. Um, 
but but I'm just I just love reading everything. I'm a really avid reader. Um, I read quickly. Um, I read ten languages. I read English very quickly. My main superpower is that mm-hmm. I read like a hundred pages an hour. Oh my god! English. So I mean, I just like consume books and like not just academic stuff. A lot of it's academic, but I read you know a lot of novels. Um, in particular, um, a lot of music criticism, you know, different kinds of areas. But I kind of read really widely and I try and read outside of the straitjacket of any one discipline. And so I've been really fortunate that the work I've produced thus far has appealed to scholars, not just in religious studies, but I've gotten positive reviews in history of philosophy, in a history of psych- psychology, um, in, in f- contemporary theory places, philosophy, uh, history of science, science and technology studies, and what have you, um, Asian studies. So, and uh, professionally, I'm primarily in the religion department, but I'm also the chair of the science and technology studies program here. So those are my two big homes. It's um, just wonderful. I mean, you got yeah. so much going on. I-, I wish really quick that I could read that fast. I mean, oh my gosh, that would make my life so much better. And I would, I'm so jealous of you. Uh, so um, I'm reading your, your book, The Myth of Displacement, Magic, Modernity, and the Birth of the Human Sciences. And I'm reading it right now and I'm loving it. It is such a wide ranging view of of like anthropology and sociology and folklore and psychoanalysis and all those great things you just mentioned. And I noticed that you tend to do a really good job of like discussing the turning points in the lives of those you profile. Like I was really into the Alistair Crowley, uh, Alistair Crowley yeah. chapter where you talked about the turning points in his life. What are the turning points in your life that took you down this career path that you pursued to where you have gotten interested in all these different fields? Like what's your professional road like? Um, it, It's... Yeah, it's a little bit weird. It's a little ways, in some ways, overdetermined. So both my parents are academics. They're both philosophers. Uh, Three out of my four grandparents were academics of some sort, either college or uh, university-based educators. Um, My dad's family, if you go far enough back, they're rabbis. So in a way, there was a lot of pressure toward a kind of scholasticism. But that said, I was rebelled against it. I wanted to be a rock musician for Mm. a long time. Um, I started a a company that shot music videos. I um, did it when I did my own undergrad, I did a double degree in um, film script writing and in in religion. Um, So in in that respect, I wanted to do a lot of other creative things. And then I've sort of fallen into academia as a kind of by default, or maybe because I got a lot of positive reinforcement, basically, from undergraduate through graduate school and into PhD. Um, And in terms of subfield, like why I study the particular academic areas I do, I was really interested in basically philosophy uh, from a young age. But um, the stuff that, um, you know, when I took college level philosophy courses, the things that I found most interesting were like classical Greek philosophy and East Asian philosophy, Chinese and Japanese philosophy. But by the time we got into what was considered like the central things that people were thinking about in philosophy departments, like basically logic chopping and um, symbolic logic or really abstruse arguments about is the cat on the mat true in all possible worlds. I found that stuff really boring. Um, So I ended up finding myself in a religion department because that was where people took seriously Asian philosophical thought and more attempts to figure out philosophy as kind of a way of life. And that was what sort of drew me into those kinds of traditions. Um, And then, yeah, intellectually, basically um, master's a program um, at a divinity school, but focusing on world religions. Um, although I got a background in Christianity and then graduate school in a more straightforward um, PhD program in religion, but with a strong emphasis on continental philosophy. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay. What about music? Okay. So I know that you play some music. I noticed former rocker in the title of your Twitter bio. What kind of uh, music are you into? Oh, I'm a, um, it pretty eclectic, um, all over. Like this morning on the drive in, I was listening to Joy Division. Um, but when I write, I like to listen to music that isn't in English, so or isn't in the language that I'm writing in, and I was writing in English today. So I was listening to a bunch of Chinese hip hop, um, some German industrial music. Uh, some Tuareg blues from Mali. I have a radio program, a uh, podcast, um, DJ Jason Danger's Transnational Underground. Oh, I, sweet. I, so you can, people can find that. I think only, I haven't updated episodes for a long time. I mostly do it out of the radio station here, but I think there are about 60 episodes on iTunes if you want to listen to them. But basically there I do kind of, I take music on a theme, um, but I cover um, all over the globe. So for example, I'll do a week on international rockabilly, or I'll do a week on the music of Thailand or, or whatever and i'll kind of assemble that material together but um in terms of what i play i used to play in punk rock and goth bands nice so i still have that as kind of in the background
in there. Yeah. Do you have any like uh, music figures that inspired you, or, like that you think about whenever you connect your two worlds of like religious studies and music? Like, are there any like uh, like I think about like Greg Graffin from Bad Religion a lot, or Chris Hanna from Propaganda. Like, and these guys are kind of like crossover figures for me in my intellectual life and also my music yeah. life. Do you have any crossover figures like that? Yeah, I mean, maybe Nick Cave, uh, Nick Cave and the Bad oh, yeah. Seeds. I mean, Nick Cave is probably one of the, probably my favorite all-time musician, I would say, at the moment. Um, but with a lot of really complex grappling with with religious issues, of religion and violence, um, sort of, uh, but but uh, faith and the, and the limits of it. Um, but also, like, more recently, I get inspiration from everything. So, like, recently I've been listening to a lot to Saul Williams. Um, yeah. He's a hip-hop artist, and his stuff is a... Uh, is really fabulous. I he's think amazing. I, that, I may actually even be footnoting him in the introduction to this thing I'm writing. Cause yeah. you know, he, he said some stuff in a, in a way that I really like, but um, yeah, all over the place. I guess I saw, yeah. I saw Saul Williams open up for the Mars Volta on the D Laust and the comatorium tour, right when they started. And Saul wow. Williams comes out and just speaks into a microphone for like an hour, like straight in our faces. And it was just mind blowing and so captivating. I think about that kind of stuff all the time. Um, okay. So, Real quick, uh, I want to talk a lot about your book today, and because I could talk about music forever. But yeah, you got this—you got this amazing book, dude. It is just so wild. Thanks. The Myth of Disenchantment, and this is a wild ride. I absolutely am loving this book, and I'm not done with it yet. So, just full disclaimer. But because, like I said, I'm a slow reader. But before we get into this, you have the title, "The Myth of Disenchantment." What is disenchantment? What is enchantment? What do these terms mean? Yeah, great. So part of my argument is that, that enchantment and disenchantment have meant different things to different theorists in a way people have been talking about different things necessarily without realizing them. Um, um, you know, they think that they're talking about the same stuff, but they don't know it. But often disenchantment is a description of a sociological trend about a subset of popular beliefs coupled with a sense of loss. So, for example, um, in the Frankfurt School, when they talked about disenchantment, they meant people stopped believing in spirits or myths and that this stripped the world of a kind of meaning. But one of the ironies is that disenchantment and enchantment often don't match up very well. So, for example, some people could believe in spirits, but not magic, or they could believe in spirits, but also that the world is meaningless, or they could believe in enlightenment and have, a, have it as a myth or, or what have you. The, the other thing is that what somebody thinks of as an enchanted belief, what one theorist thinks of as an enchanted belief, isn't always in the same set as another theorist. So some people might think that believing in psychic powers is an example of enchanted belief, and other people might be like, no, no, psychic powers are totally real. Um, it's not enchanted belief, it's a scientific belief, or what mm -hmm. have you. So one of the things I was interested in is sort of teasing out the long history of um, a conversation about those terms, and in particular because one of the biggest stories we've been telling ourselves in religious studies or and in sociology um, for the for the last hundred years is a story about modernity in terms of disenchantment. This is a story that says that the central feature of modernity is that people no longer believe uh, people in the modern West no longer believe in the same kinds of things that pre-modern peoples believed in. And if if people are if when theorists specify, they often say that what people no longer believe in is supposed to be spirits. Uh, magic and myth, although they sometimes draw the lines in different places, as I was saying. But it's this grand sort of sociological narrative about what is supposed to make the modern world modern. Basically, we got rid of magic and brought in science. But as I argue in the book, and this is what the title is from, that narrative is false. It's a myth. It is itself a myth. Um, although we could, you know, fine tune what exactly I mean by myth or, or what have you. Okay, yeah. so I really like the idea of these uh, talking about expressions of enchantment. Like I've had Andrew Chestnut on the show. He's a Santa Muerte um, scholar and I've had Kate Kingsbury on with Andrew to talk about exorcism. And I yeah. want to talk about these expressions of enchantment. So what are some, because like these things are actually supposed to be increasing in societies around the world instead of decreasing is from what I'm seeing. Yeah. So what are some examples of things that people can do that might be considered enchantment? Well, so to take a step back, to get one click meta, a lot of the writings about enchantment, when people are looking for enchantment, have mostly been anthropologists. Okay, yeah. And most of them have been European anthropologists looking outside of Europe. So what they have described in these anthropological terms as enchanted belief are things like spirit belief, exorcism, belief in talismans, magic, witchcraft, sometimes uh, psychic or paranormal belief or, or myths. 
And but in, in those measures, at least uh, as part of a description of the global world, if you think those things are enchanted, then those things are definitely increasing. And one of the ironies is that a lot of anthropologists have only been looking outside of the modern West. And so what they've said is, oh, like Africa is full of people who believe in witchcraft without noting that the U.S. is full of people who believe in witchcraft. So one of the main interventions I'm trying to do in the book is turn that anthropological gaze inward. What if we look at the kind of things that uh, anthropologists have counted as expressions of enchantment in different parts of the globe? Can we find them here? And the first surprise is that, yes, we can find them here, maybe not the exact same terms, but almost uh, almost identically. We can find many of them in, in the modern West. And by most measures, many of those things seem to be increasing or at least not vanishing as as people had thought. Like some people would be like, oh, yes, the, they believe in witchcraft in Africa, but people used to believe in witchcraft in America, but don't anymore. But that, again, we have to complexify that story. OK, so because the title of the book suggests that people believe that we are currently disenchanted. And that's that, correct. Um, yeah. And then in the in the in the page four of the book, you said that a defining feature of modernity is the departure of the supernatural. So so what can you tell me about what you notice as each year passes by with regards to actual enchantments in modern societies? Because enchantment is still here. So what are you noticing uh, as somebody who yeah. follows this deeply? Yeah. So, for example, you know, if you, you can go to um, it, let's talk about the mod modern America for the moment. So you yeah. can. Uh, most American towns have uh, fortune tellers, have palm readers or psychics in them. Mm -hmm. Most Americans consult uh, their astrological chart. Um, you can go on eBay right now and ask someone to summon a spirit for you. You can go to Urban Outfitters and you can buy healing crystals. You can go to Walmart and order spirit sage sticks. Uh, in many coffee shops throughout America, you see signs that advertise things like uh, spirit healing, psychic powers, energy work, uh, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, many sectors of the society, many people believe in the reality of demonic possession and are performing exorcisms. So uh, the, these kind of beliefs are all over the place, basically. Um, and one of the arguments, you know, people have defined modernity in terms of the departure of these kind of beliefs. And one of the things I want to say is, in a certain way, we're not modern if that's the definition of modernity. Nowhere it turns out to be modern. It's not just the West, but there's a sort of grand story about modernity as rupture, as a, as a kind of, you know, we've got rid of superstition and suddenly became rational, or we got rid of myth and suddenly became scientific, but that just didn't happen. Um, there have been shifts, and I, I don't want to say everything has been static. One of the insights of the book, too, is that a lot of the beliefs that we have about some of these categories have changed in significant ways over time. So we don't understand uh, demons the same way that we understood demons 200 years ago, or people who believe in them don't understand them in the same way. Or there might have been, there's been more fragmentation, for example. The, they're more diverse. Some people think crystals are, are powerful. Some people don't think crystal takes crystals seriously. Or some people believe in ghosts. Other people believe that those ghosts are demons or, you know, what have you. So there's definitely been a pluralization of belief within uh, the, the Western world, but it hasn't been a precipitous falling off anyway. What's yeah. so interesting is that like people could take things like something like tarot seriously, but then discard view of ghosts. You know, there's like a there's like a, a a mixing of what people would ascribe to, and then a discounting of other things that we might also call enchantments. There's like a, not a total buy-in across the spectrum, is there? Right, and interestingly, that's one of the observations um, that I that I found strikingly when I was doing fieldwork is that. People often think that the other person's, let's say, enchanted beliefs are, are, are false or superstitious or silly, even though they don't think that of their own. So, yeah, people who believe in tarot but not ghosts or psychical powers or, or not demons or vice versa. I mean, so, you know, it, it, I think that's exactly right. So I think of it, I, I, I can't remember exactly the term I tried to coin to, to describe it. It's now been a, a couple of years since I reread the, my, my own book. But, <laughs> but it's something like but, – but enchantments often cancel each other out, basically. Okay. So, um, and in that respect, enchantment itself produces disenchantment. Okay, cool. So in just a little while, we're going to talk a lot about some historical figures that you profile in the book, but there's a term that I want to get into really quick. So I've sure. been following the work of um, Damien Eccles recently, and he talks a lot about magic with a K on the end of it, and you have magic with a C on the end of it, like the normal spelling that we've always thought about. How would you define magic for the listener with regards to like, the subtitle of the book? And how does it differ from the other use of the term magic with a K on the end that we might see in other places in society right now? Yeah, great. Um, so I'll get meta again. This, yeah. this, but um, 
what I'm interested in is that the way that the magic now with a C historically meant different things, and it meant quite different things than we imagine it now. So, for example, if you look at um, early modern Europe or, or the Middle Ages, magic didn't mean Harry Potter. Like, Harry Potter really isn't a good depiction of what people believed. Uh, to give, give you a more concrete example, in a text like the Malleus Maleficarum uh, by Heinrich Kramer, which is a 15th century text that launched the witchcraft persecution, magic is very specifically defined as not supernatural. It is, it is not a supernatural power, but it is the power to manipulate hidden natural forces, either by having secret knowledge of the powers of plants and animals or by way of demons. But the, he thought demons were real beings. They were just kind of like gaseous beings. So that was how Kramer thought magic worked and how witches worked. So in a way, and it's older, meaning magic was closer to something like the paranormal or psychic forces. But significantly, the meaning of magic changed over time. And often people threw around the word magic just to describe somebody else's religion or rituals. So when you're talking about the magic of people that people perform in sub-Saharan Africa or something like that, that's often what we might think of as their religion, but but not recognize as such. So one of the things I'm interested in is the way that magic is often a polemical category used to other, or if you embrace it, it can be a way of talking about kinds of powers that your ritual is capable of, at least in the contemporary period. Okay, cool. Uh, really quick. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. To get to magic with the K, oh, yeah, that's, sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's a differentiation that, that happens mostly because of, a, of Aleister Crowley. And Crowley basically wanted to distinguish it from stage magic, from that thing, which is a 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century kind of performative stage magic, which is all um, less sleight of hand, ledger domain, or, or self-consciously illusion. Gotcha. So he's like, okay, that's not this. This is magic with a K. This is the real magic that, that does stuff in the world. Okay. I, but you were going to come in somewhere else. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to do a, a, a pop culture shout out because you said the word Malleus Maleficarum, which is also yeah. a uh, the title of a song on the classic. Like 1999 AFI record, Black Sails in the Sunset. Hooray. So can we talk about global trends for a second? Sure. Okay, so let's talk first about the global south because there's yeah. a lot happening in the global south. And so of the global south, you write that modern and traditional forms of magic include internet-based virtual Haitian voodoo, spirit possession among Malaysian factory workers, clairvoyant Brazilian spirit surgeons, witchcraft persecutions in South Africa and Indonesia, Vietnamese divinities that are appeased with cans of Coke, and then aerosol sprays to evoke Santa Muerte. And the list goes on. So for a listener that is like skeptical of um, like our disenchantment today, they might say this is like a load of baloney. What would you suggest they do if they like get off a plane in the global south um, and to go experience these things and to disabuse themselves of such a notion of disenchantment? Yeah. Okay, great. So first, I, just to clarify, because some of your listeners I know are not um, academics, the global south is a term that refers to basically impoverished parts of the world, um, as opposed to the global north. So it's not a geographic north and south. It, it, so um, and in the global south, um, in the, let's say, the less developed parts of the world, um, the story has often been that the global south has magic, but it's also that the that the magic in the global south is supposed to be left over. It's supposed to be archaic. It's supposed to be like things that people have believed for thousands of years, but like haven't gotten rid of yet. And so the surprise is that there are very contemporary forms of magic in these places. So, um, you know, like you would think that um, that capitalism and factories dispel ghosts. People have often said that, but actually, you know, you as I as you gave that example, um, or as I mentioned in the book, spirit possession is quite was quite endemic among Malaysian factory workers, or something like that. So, in a way, anthropolo anthropologists or many people traveling the global south tend to do that, expecting to see superstitions or magical belief. But the surprise is that those beliefs are, in many respects. Um, very new, and that they evolve and come to incorporate things that you might otherwise miss, like um, you know Coca-Cola or you know kinds of things that look like modern artifacts, like aerosol sprays or um, technologically uh, or like USB drives that work as protective talismans or what mm. have you. And so you can find a lot of these things if, if you're concretely interested. It depends a lot on what particular geography you're, you're, you're going to. You can, um, in some places, there are professionalized um, people who engage in magical practices, uh, you know, whether they're condomble, uh, per performing condomble for, uh, for uh, parishioners or you can just see them on the streets. I mean, it really varies a lot by, by country to country, um, depending on what exactly you're looking for. But once you, but, but you could also read almost any ethnography of contemporary 
contemporary belief systems in anywhere outside of the modern uh, industrialized West, and you'll find plenty of examples. Okay. Um, so as a researcher, like, do you, ha- do you have any travel experiences in the Global South for like research purposes? No, most of my travel in the Global South has been uh, for tourism, but uh, for I, for research purposes, I mostly went to Japan, Europe, and parts of the U.S., and Japan is an interestingly an anomalous case in that it's not part of the Global South because it's part of the industrialized world, but it's not part of the Euro-American industrialized world. And so um, one of the early things that I did when I originally thought this project was going to have more of a Japanese component is I went and I interviewed people about uh, contemporary belief in spirits and talisman in Japan today. Um, and I was interested in particularly things like there's a famous shrine uh, near Kyoto called Dendengu, which is a shrine of the god of telegraph and telephone. And you can buy uh, these uh, these magical um, at, at SIM cards you can stick in your phone that protect it against uh, uh, electrical problems, kind of. Oh, wow. And, and so, you know, I was really interested in those kind of belief systems or, and how technology and and let's say, you know, enchanted belief fit together in Japan, that kind of dropped out of the final book, which is mostly because uh, in part it dropped out of the final book because when I told people about, oh, people in Japan uh, believe in spirits or magic, I kept encountering a trope, a theme. Um, people kept saying, oh, that's mystic Asia, or of course Japan is more mystical than the West or whatever. And I thought that was bull because basically um, I, I want to suggest that the belief systems in Japan and the U.S. in regard to things like enchantment are less different than they might first appear. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of what pushed me toward doing more ethnographic work in the U.S. Uh, and in Western Europe. Speaking yeah. of the U.S., um, in the USA, the paranormal is normal. And only yeah. like approximately like one quarter of Americans are not believers in the paranormal that you write in the book, such as like demonic possession, ghosts, telepathy or whatever. And skeptics of the paranormal in the U.S. are the clear minority, which I think would be shocking to a lot of people. So yeah. with each passing year, what does the story of American enchantment look like today? Yeah, great. Yeah. So first, you know, just for your listeners who might not have read the book, I don't say that um, everybody believes in all of those categories. As we were saying earlier, it's an aggregate. So, you know, maybe 25 percent believe in the paranormal and 50 percent believe in demonic possession. And some of those are overlapping and some of them aren't or what have you. But yeah, totally. Something like 75 percent of Americans believe in paranormal categories. If you think uh, or if you want to track, let's say, belief in uh, invisible uh, entities like uh, ghosts, spirits, uh, demons or angels, something like 83% of Americans believe in that. 90% of Americans believe in God, although I would, you know, God might be part of a different category. So, um, but what does American enchantment look like? Um, so I, what I'm interested in is how it evolves over time. So just let me give you a long durée story, but yeah. that's too far, too far back. But um, in the early 19th century, for example, um, there was uh, in the burnt over district of upstate New York, not that far from where you are, uh, there were a large number of people who believed in spirits in a new way. Uh, part of it was the influence of a particular Swedish mystic named Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, but also there were many settlers in at that time period who lived in you know, the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, who were not Dutch, but German. It's Deutsch, but we remember it as Dutch. Many of them were followers of Jakob Boma, who was a German theosophist, mystic, and they believed in sort of magical symbols and alchemy and Christian Kabbalah. Uh, Pennsylvania is supposed to be the magical state in the United States in the 18th and early 19th century. Hmm. From there, uh, in the in the mid 19th century, uh, there's something also not that far from you, um, the Fox sisters, uh, also in upstate New York, who uh, a, a pair of sisters who described a kind of wrapping or table turning that happened uh, in the presence of ghosts. And that launched a kind of boom starting in the U.S. and but also in a way globally uh, for something called spiritualism, which is where we get like seances and Ouija boards um, and a lot of kind of 19th century ghost belief. So. Um, to, to get more recent, then in the 1870s, uh, we have the rise of the Theosophical Society, which was uh, something started in New York City in 1970, 18, 1873 or 1874, which was an attempt to recover like magical traditions from different parts of the globe, um, in part. Um, then, you know, from there, from, so that, they're the original hippies, kind of. They brought uh, <laughs> yoga to the U.S., 
they brought other kinds of like new age traditions, basically, um, already like more than 100 years ago. So from there, we could we could talk about all these different trends. We could talk about occult revivals of early 1900, or we could talk about um, the 1930s, which were big uh, in terms of a kind of new globalized, uh, let's say, occultism and, and mysticism. Or we could talk about the 60s, where we have a return of an Eastern focused so-called new age and people were getting interested in ashrams, uh, but also in crystals and crystal power. And that gives way to the 70s, which is a similar type of phenomena, um, but with an emphasis on the tradition syncretizing together in new ways, uh, less Eastern, but also more kind of indigenous forms of belief were drawn in. Uh, we could keep going anyway, like 90s was another occult boom. Uh, in our current moment, just to get really concrete, the one of the most recent shifts in contemporary belief is the proliferation of things like meme magic. So uh, one of the things, so to take a little step back, if you look on, uh, I think it started actually on the brony part of um, 4chan. But anyway, there were some people who were like really big fans of My Little Pony, and they recovered an idea from the Theosophical Society that there were things called thought forms or tulkus, which is associated, uh, or I'm sorry, tulpas, which is associated with Tibetan Buddhism, but was particularly a theosophical idea. The idea was like if you could imagine new things into existence. So these are a bunch of bronies basically like trying to imagine My Little Pony creatures into existence. But then that got picked up by people who took it seriously and who were trying to imagine new gods into existence. And one of the most famous is uh, this attempt to produce, uh, turn the cartoon figure of Pepe into an Egyptian god called Kek, who was supposed to be a dark god that, that, that supposedly won Donald Trump the election. Like many things on the Internet, it, it runs the line between is it a joke or is it do some people really believe in it based on some interviews that I've done? Uh, some people really believe in it and some people think it's a joke. But, you know, that's one of the big shifting kind of things going on is uh, is that. Um, you also see, you know, celebrities trying to hex people. Uh, Lana Del Rey uh, and and uh, tried to hex just, I think, last year, the year before. And, and some people uh, cast a hex on the NRA, I think it was. So um, or, or there was a bunch of Russian witches who who just hexed Vladimir Putin. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on and you can see it all over the place on Twitter or Reddit or Instagram or whatever your preferred platform is. Wow. Um, so, I mean, magic isn't gone, and, and yeah. in a way it, it's proliferating. Yeah. And you also say in the book that it's a mistake to assume that education leads towards disenchantment in the U.S. Like, what are the demographics and, like, uh, the education level of people who believe in these things? Um, so different beliefs tend to be correlated with different degrees of education. So, for example, less educated people are more likely to believe in witches and demons. More educated people are more likely to believe in ghosts and psychic powers. So it's just you're like, it, it, which ones you believe in are different depending on education. But um, I think the one that is most widespread based on education is haunted houses. So the more educated you are, for some reason, people seem to demographically be more likely to believe in haunted houses. But I'd have to look at the exact novels to see, you know, ex exactly how the correlations work out. Um, so but in a way, that's one of the interesting things is that people exchange beliefs. So, you know, people at, when they were young might have believed that demons were real and then they decide, OK, they're not demons, but they still believe that something unusual happened to them in that in the woods one day and so they decide that those must have been ghosts or must have been telepathy or or what have you um and there still are skeptics and you might suspect that some of the 25 percent or 23 percent or depending on what you're talking about of americans or skeptics are located in the academy but but clearly not all of them um and you know yeah do you think that like the americans living in this like world of wonder like so you're, you're involved in science and technology at your institution as well so do you think that people believing in uh these types of ideas um, prevents us from accomplishing anything of great value to like the future of humanity. Is this holding us back? No, I, I don't think so. I don't want to say that it's either good or bad. Um, I think humans just have different kinds of belief systems. Humans are not fully rational creatures. That's the easiest way to put it. And I'm not trying to overjudge people. I don't think these are these beliefs are either bad or good. I'm not trying to either attack believers in the paranormal or make fun of them. No, definitely um, not. So, and I, but, and I also, but, and one of the main points too is that I don't think America is an exception. There's been some recent articles. There was something in the Atlantic or something like about how Americans are supposedly just went bonkers and threw out rationality. I don't think that's true either. We're not getting less rational. We're also not getting more rational. And the U.S. is much more like the developing world than it likes to pretend. Basically, many people are roughly the same degree of rational all over the globe. And most people all over the globe believe in the existence of spirits. 
So, I mean, of different sorts, so they define them differently and, and there may be different uh, things that beliefs that they associate with them. So in a way, um, I think some of these grand narratives about either American exceptionalism or modernity as a kind of new, totally new way of thinking in the world, or even some of the criticisms of Eurocentric thought as rationality is exclusively Eurocentric. None of that's really true either. It's not like um, people are less rational in Asia than they are in the United States okay. or less rational in Africa. Everybody's about the same mix of rationality and irrationality. So if we, uh, if we think yeah. about like rationality, we, we probably tend to think that Europe is a particular level of rationality. Like a, a modern uh, American person might think that, oh, Europe believes less in God and things like that. So in a recent New York Times article said that God is out, but spirits and ghosts are filling the vacuum. So how is Europe not what Americans might expect with regards to enchantment and the paranormal? Great. And good that you put it in the context of, of belief in God, because that's so let me take a step back. So one of the big disconnects between Europe and America is that is belief in God. So something like 90 percent of Americans say they believe in God on surveys, a, a lower percentage if you give them the chance to say they believe in a higher power. So, you know, we could complexify the number slightly. But in Europe, belief in God is much lower on the average. It varies quite a bit by country to country, but you get something like less than 40 percent. Some European countries like the Czech Republic, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's really low, like less than 10 percent, something like that. So this question about belief in God and church attendance is sometimes called secularization theory. Again, for, for non-academic listeners, the idea was that religion was supposed to dwindle with modernity. And people have challenged that to some degree in the United States because basically Americans didn't get less religious. The oddity is that Western Europe got less religious. So secularization theory seems to apply to places like England or the Czech Republic or what have you, where people aren't going to church in the same numbers and don't have God belief in the, belief in God in the same numbers. But that said, one of the interventions in my book is to break secularization of disenchantment. And the reason I do that is because belief in enchantment, again, broadly defined, um, is, is, is equally common in Europe and America. So the percentage of people who believe in ghosts uh, in Europe is about comparable to the percentage of people who believe in ghosts in the United States, even if belief in God is going down. And, and there's some evidence that as European countries secularize, they actually get into more enchanted beliefs. So there's so you get the rise of not just the spiritual but not religious, but you get um, you know dechurching behavior often contributes to people believing in the power of witchcraft or psychic powers or ghosts or what have you. Okay. Excuse me. So what? So one of the so there's this there was this like something in the Daily Mail, which is a really terrible uh, uh, news <laughs> yeah. source, but but it had a title like um, uh, God is out and ghosts are in or something like that, talking about British belief, because in many cases, the number of paranormal believers is in Western Europe is larger or higher than the number of people who go to church or who are find themselves as believers of identifiable um, forms of a mainstream faith. So in that respect, one of the arguments in the book is to try and break apart a secularization and disenchantment. And it doesn't turn out that, that Europe is necessarily more enchanted than the U.S., but it's less religious and about equally enchanted. So that, that also doesn't fit the narrative about how the U.S. supposedly lost its mind, as, as the Atlantic <laughs> article I was criticizing was talking about. So if an open-minded and curious person wanted to go on like a trip to in Europe and the USA to witness enchantment firsthand, do you have any like travel destinations? nations that you would suggest people check out? I think if you're in the U.S., you can find it in your like co-op uh, on the bulletin board. You can find it in the palm readers um, on your street corners of your small town. You can find it online or in newspapers. Um, I think in Europe, too, if you travel to almost any major European city, you're going to find things like um, uh, especially if you're looking for it, uh, occult bookstores, uh, new age shops, you're going to find, uh, and, and you can spiral out from there. You can find uh, organizational meetings to perform different kinds of um, magic craft, or you can find people who believe in psychic powers. I mean, in a way, um, so there's this uh, contemporary scholar, Jeff Kripal, um, who has a recent book called The Flip, where one of the things he observes, uh, he's writing about contemporary scientists, is that uh, a lot of scientists, if, if they're in the laboratory or in the lecture hall they're, and they're talking to you about their belief, they're going to describe their beliefs in that form as if they're totally materialist, as if the only thing that they believe in is matter and, you know, naturalized scientific laws. But if you get them, uh, have a drink with them at the bar, then they'll tell you about beliefs in things like spirits or psychic powers or what have you. I think that's true over a lot of the world. I don't think you need to go anywhere special to see examples of uh, enchanted belief. You just have to get your, your, your friends and family drunk enough to let down their guard or... <laughs> 
or, you know, get people, uh, you know, or get people relaxed enough or comfortable with you in coffee shops or bars or what have you, restaurants across the world, and try and get them to talk to you about what they actually believe in about the world. Well, yeah. let's talk about some of history's most famous scientists then in that regard, like Marie Curie, uh, Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, Rene Descartes. Um, because these people have some overlooked history worth discussing. And, you know, I feel like when we tend to talk about scientists today in 2019, the term enchantment may not be exactly what comes to mind. So let's step back a bit in time, discuss these well-known people. Um, and you start the book with this fascinating antidote, anecdote about the Nobel Prize winner Marie Curie, in which she attends like a spiritual seance led by a psychic named Eusebia Palladino. So I'm reading the book, and you describe a multitude of scientists with deep interest in magic, and her husband called... Uh, Palladino impossible to deny due to the experience being performed under what he called perfectly controlled conditions. So my question about the Curies is this. What must Palladino have done in those rooms to convince some of the most famous scientists in history that there are unusual powers among us? Yeah. So in this particular case, we actually have a good record. Um, there was uh, there was a secretary, a recording secretary there who took minutes on it. I can't remember his name. And the, the minutes are in French, but but he took minutes of all of the various sessions. And, the you know, and I've read through those, the kinds of things Paladino was supposed to do. Paladino basically was a woman who um, took was a spiritual medium and she was inhabited by a spirit. She called John King at various times. She she claimed to be able to talk to the dead. But the thing that uh, Curie and company were interested in was the fact that she was also a physical medium. She was supposed to be able to make things move. Uh, some of these described levitating artifacts uh, in, in these in usually darkened spaces. She also made lights appear. Um, in one famous incident, she she reached her hands out and made uh, and supposedly made glowing lights appear around um, Mary Curie's uh, head. Um, Paladino also, you know, would, would it, yeah, so basically like lights and movement, basically. Um, there was some recording of, of things that were quasi ectoplasmic that like you could see for a minute, but that didn't actually have physical form. But she's anyway supposed to be a physical medium. Um, we can't totally rule out charlatanism or what have you, but but at least the Curies and company were trying to test her in a rigorous scientific environment and where uh, she couldn't have, uh, in theory, resort to any kind of trickery. And mainly she was interesting because of her ability to move objects um, while in a sort of a trance state and move objects without touching them or by touching them lightly. She would like lightly touch a desk and it would levitate upward. At least that's what some of the people in the room described. You know, because like they would be looking for things that wouldn't be that normal folks without scientific training would be looking for. So like I imagine Pierre, Pierre Curie is looking for something really specific in those moments, right? Yeah. And what, one of the things that the Curies theorized was that um, – that there were certain kinds of, uh, let's say, we might call them today psychical forces at work, so that she was able to be moving things with her mind. And they were trying to think that those might be related to other kinds of invisible energy, like uh, X-rays or the kinds of radiation that Mary Curie was so interested in studying. So, I mean, that was part of her theory about how Palladino was able to to do what she could do, which was to tap in to some kinds of unseen forces. Um, but they also thought that she might really be talking to spirits. Um, at least uh, Mary Curie's husband thought that that was true. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think scientists... So there's this sort of cliche that assumes that science and magic are necessarily opposed and that science strips magic out of the world. But that's not necessarily true. In fact, definitionally, much of what we talk about as magic and science are overlapping categories. And so these they were trying to sort of explore hidden forces in the world, uh, many of these famous scientists, and they just took them seriously. Um, so and scientists in general have been more open minded than pop science writers give them credit for part of the way that, you know, a lot of innovative scientists came to their innovative ideas was to just be open minded about the world and what might exist in it. So, you know, we see this in quantum physicists, for example, like Wolfgang Pauli or, um, or, or Oppenheimer or, or whatever early nuclear physics. They were often interested in new age traditions and, and, uh, and what have you as ways to kind of think about the world, uh, quantum entanglement and out of time, the way that quantum physics seems to suggest time doesn't function in the way we think it does or, you know, what have you. So um, in that respect, one of the things I'm trying to do in that uh, book is sort of push against the presumption that um, you know, science necessarily strips uh, uh, wonder or excitement or spirits or what have you from the world. Well, in Maynard, John Maynard Keynes called Isaac Newton the last of the magicians, you know. So what can you tell listeners a little bit about Newton's obsession with like alchemy, philosopher's stone, hidden biblical code? How does that play a role in somebody who we never talk about that aspect of Newton's life in classes today? Like, what are we missing? 
Yeah. So, I mean, Newton thought of his scientific research as very well connect, very closely connected to his biblical research. He was looking for codes in the Bible that would, he, he made his own prophecies uh, about when the time was going to end uh, at one point. I think we already missed that date, so don't freak out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but but he uh, he translated a text, uh, 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 the Emerald Tablet that was about the, uh, now chemical text about the Philosopher's Stone. I mean, he, Newton lived in a way before the separation of alchemy and magic from what we think of as science. So um, uh, and the other thing is like, even in his physics, we forget how much, let's say, uh, enchantment played a role. Let, let me, let me get, get more specific. Newton is often described in the secondary scholarship as somebody who brought in a despiritualized nature, who turned nature just into a mechanism, basically, uh, just a bunch of predictable clockwork forces. But what actually Newton did, if you actually read the Principia Mathematica or, or many of his writings, he believed, for example, that, that the reason that the planets didn't slam into each other is because periodically there was a divine reset, that angels were actively involved in the world. Um, he specifically refers to the supernatural to explain problems with his physics. He's not describing it as a despiritualized world. God is a big part of his project. And so partially what we've done is we've secularized Newton, but we've also stripped out the beliefs that seem weird to us, things like his belief in alchemy. But the, but his idea of gravity was really weird. His time In his time period, what would have been the more, let's say, you know, uh, mechanistic position was articulated by uh, earlier thinkers called the corpuscular uh, theory of matter, where everything acts on something else by pushing against it. And into that, Newton imported this idea of action at a distance. Gravity um, is an occult force. And, and Leibniz, who was one of Newton's early interlocutors and kind of enemies, described Newton as bringing invisible magical forces into physics. And because because, you know, gravity, how does it work? Newton wasn't sure, but he was sure that there was action at a distance and that he had proved it. So in a way, again, we tell ourselves different stories about these people. We want to make them into kind of paragons of a contemporary set of beliefs. And we tend to ignore the complexity of their beliefs in the past, whether we're praising them or demonizing them. People demonize Newton for stripping mechanism out of the world or they celebrate him as the truly rational inventor of modern science or modern physics. But he's, again, he's a mix, right? He has all these complicated beliefs and he turns out to be a much more rich uh, and um, creative thinker than we tend to give him credit for. Well, and then there's Bacon too. Francis Bacon, the father of the scientific method, he sees himself as an alchemist and he's like also preparing humanity for an imminent apocalypse. Um, what is yeah. intriguing to you that you wish Bacon would know uh, for students in 2019 who are learning about him? So, yeah. So, I mean, Francis Bacon is usually described as the person who discovered the scientific method. The Royal Society in England is uh, is inspired by Bacon. Um, a lot of people make reference to him, particularly a text of his called The Advancement of Learning. But actually, and, and people think of him, either they celebrate or condemn him also for stripping out forces out of nature or like, you know, coming up with this sort of experimental method. But actually, Bacon thought he was working out magic. And in fact, he described what we think of as modern science as a return to the magic of the ancients. And in particular, he thought he was recovering Adamic wisdom that had been lost by the fall. Um, and so, um, he, again, um, he wanted to, in a way, what he didn't like about magical belief uh, but that was performed by his contemporaries was that it was secretive. So what he wanted to do was in a way disenchant magic, or at least in, in a certain way, I'm playing with the language here, but let's say de-occultize magic and make it public and available to scrutiny because he thought there were a mix of charlatans and people who could really do magical things. But he thought the role of a scientist was to take seriously the possibility that certain kinds of at least what we could call natural magic worked. And then the point of science was to recover anything that worked. So he also lived in a natural world where he thought that he thought was deeply inhabited by spirits. So, uh, again, he's a figure to whom people have accused him of despiritualizing the world, but he actually lived in a world where he thought nature was full of these uh, things like slips, uh, you know, little invisible kinds of spirits. And so part of what he's trying to do is figure out how to control those or manipulate those for the for the advancement of science. So all that is to say, again, he's a figure about whom you can either celebrate or, crit or, or critique, but he doesn't fit the received view. I love it. Okay, so that's but we're busting some stereotypes here over these people. Yeah. It's fantastic. All right, so in the middle of the book, you have this big section about the decline of magic, but then a guy that we already talked about a little bit, Aleister Crowley, comes on the scene, and he sort of like saves modern magic, I guess is my interpretation of the book, mm -hmm. um, in ways that can like still be seen in like Wicca and the Church of Satan. Um, why is Crowley an essential figure to consider when thinking about enchantment in 2019? 
Okay, so let me take a step back. So I, sure. he he described himself as intervening in the decline oh, of magic. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm not sure that it, the magic was actually in decline, but it's true that he had a huge impact later. So let okay. me take a step back though and, and tell you a little bit about why Crowley is interesting to me in particular. Um, so first of all, for those of you who haven't heard of him, he's a British magician, perhaps the most famous occultist of the modern world. He was um, complicated figure. He was queer. Um, he wrote poetry. He per- did kind of art performance as well as being at one point described as the wickedest man in the world, a really posh Brit who was pushing the boundaries, kind of like a rock star before rock stars existed. He's even on a Beatles album cover. Uh, the Sergeant Peppers has him in the background or something. Oh, but wow. So, so he's a, so he's a very, very influential figure, but he's important in my book because of his relationship to a guy who came just before him. There's this folklorist, a guy nobody really reads anymore, uh, but he used to be quite influential, uh, J.G. Fraser, James Fraser, who is a Scottish folklorist. And and the interesting thing about Fraser, Fraser was really important because in a work called The Golden Bough, he described the first version um, or one really early version of a myth of disenchantment. And let me be more specific. It's Fraser who said something like, uh, first people believe in magic, then they believe in religion, then they believe in science. He described that as the grand trajectory of human history. So the idea is that the end goal of human thought is going to be scientific thought. And he thought, and, and Fraser thought that history was headed in that direction, basically. The surprise is that, um, so uh, Fraser taught at Trinity Cambridge, College in Cambridge, and Crowley went to Trinity College, Cambridge, and Crowley took Fraser's description of the end of magic uh, and used it as his in his attempt to revive magic. So this book that is like the central text of disenchantment becomes a spell book, and, and literally, because what Fraser had done is compile all these old ritual beliefs from uh, early from, from medieval uh, and uh, so-called pagan Europe, etc., and what Crowley and Company did is try them out. And in that respect, he led to a revival that contributed to bringing Wicca into, into public audience, to the Church of Satan. I mean, he was involved in an attempt to revive an indigenous European magical tradition, and the intermediary was an Amer- was a was a Scottish academic and a Scottish academic who described these very beliefs as vanished, but they weren't vanished, and Crowley was able to kind of recuperate them. So in that way, what's interesting to me is that juxtaposition between scholarship and enchantment and moving in a direction that you you don't anticipate. We in in the humanities and social sciences we often talk about self fulfilling prophecies. So uh, Foucault, for example, famously describes uh, you know a notion of hysteria that causes people to have his hysteria, or you know we worry about electability in terms of political candidates as though you know describing them as electable seems to make them electable or what have you. This is a weird example of a self um, unfulfilling or or whatever prophecy, uh, which is that Fraser described how magic he, it wasn't actually dead in his day, but he described how it was going to die. And his very act of describing it as in departure contributed to its revival in his own social context. And there were people who were looking up to Crowley too. Like, didn't like Jimmy Page like buy a house that Crowley like used to live in and yep. stuff like that? Yeah, there's been. I mean, Crowley had a huge influence on uh, rock and roll music, in part because he was interested in a kind of sexual libert- libertarianism. Maybe, maybe that that sounds more political than I mean to. <laughs> libertinism, we might say. Um, but Crowley, yeah, Crowley. Was a you know had a big impact on rock rock music. Led Zeppelin, uh, their references to Crowley, um, their references to Crowley uh, in David Bowie. Uh, Marilyn Manson is has huge Crowley references all over the place. Uh, there's even a Beatles reference. I mean, so um, uh, I, I mean, I could Danzig. I mean, I could keep listing them. Not just having metal musicians, but um, we can see there's some Crowley references in contemporary hip hop. But I'd have to I. Uh, let me think. Kanye has, I think, a Crowley reference at one point, although I, I could be wrong about that. Um, but anyway, but so he, he just had an outsized influence and in part because he became he was famous as a magician, basically, as a self-described magician. And he wrote these influential works like uh, Magic Without Tears or um, uh, or what have you that were attempts to figure out or describe what magic should be, how you should perform a magic ritual, what it should look like. And he was a, he also wrote um sort of uh, a, a very famous novel, Diary of a Drug Fiend, and he's sort of, and Crowley is one of the ones that connected magic up to drug use and to sex, basically. A lot of Crowleyan magic is sex magic. So um, there's a, like a contemporary television series called Strange Angel, which I just started watching with my wife um, like last week, 
and you know, which is about a real person uh, named Jack Parsons, who's a famous rocket scientist. And Parsons was heavily influenced by Crowley, and so um, what, he becomes another vector for a kind of Crowleyan society out on the West Coast, associated with science fiction readers and and literal rocket science, basically. So um, uh, at um, at, Cal at Caltech and what have you. So yeah, Crowley is is in particular a quite influential figure. And one of the things that surprised me is that there's not that much scholarship on Crowley. It's only in the last decade or so we started to see scholarship on Crowley. For a long time, people were like, oh, he's just a weird, creepy pop figure. Mm -hmm. We're not really going to work on him. But so so for that reason, one of the things I wanted to do was recover his thought and note that Crowley was pretty well educated. I mean, he had an undergraduate degree from Cambridge and he read widely in the study of religion. So in a way, he was like an amateur, but interested in basically scholarship and religious studies. And that's part of what fueled his attempt to revive magic. Man, when you're talking about like Danzig and Marilyn Manson and Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin, like you're speaking my language here, because like, I love all this like sort of like counterculture of musicians and artists and stuff like that. And you, uh, a line in the book about that jumped out at me when you said that wonder still dwells in the counterculture. And I've been intrigued as well by some other living writers like Damien Eccles, like I said earlier, but also uh, Danielle Dulsky, who has a really cool book on recent magic and witchcraft. Um, w are there any contemporary folks that you follow who like aren't academics that you think that uh, are worth looking at? Uh, in terms of magic or just uh, uh, in general? Uh, maybe magic, enchantment, like any of these trends that you see as an uptick. Like who do you think is worth following? Um, probably the main one that's not an, an academic is uh, Gary I, I, Latchman, um, who played in, I think it was Blondie or whatever, but he has a bunch of stuff on contemporary. Uh, he's almost scholarly works on contemporary uh, occult traditions. Um, he's the, I'm trying to remember whether it's Latchman or Lackman, but anyway... Um, uh, he's probably the main one about magical stuff because he's in a way a kind of pop historian of of it. Um, um, uh, 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 there's not others that are immediately coming to mind. I mean, there are others that I read sort of as if they're source material. So, okay. um, but um, but not as 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 accurate descriptions of um, magic. Is there the a, like so the book yeah. the book came out in 2017. Um, has anything happened since the publication of the book that you really wish was in it, or that you would definitely include, like in a second edition revision? There's a lot of contemporary magic stuff on the internet. So one of the things that was interesting to me, um, I have a good buddy who um, who does computer stuff basically, and was he noticed that there's uh, on the dark web there's a ton of magic stuff. One of the things that people are sharing alongside uh, illegal drugs and, uh, and he's my friend is funded by a cybersecurity company. So but anyway, but he's looked just trying to track what's out there. So in addition to sharing things like drugs and hacking exploits or what have you, one of the things that you can find in the dark web is magic is spell books. And so be curious to me and I haven't looked into it, but I'd be curious to know what spell books they're sharing and what they're doing with them. Um other kind of stuff that, that I think, I, I think if I had a second revision of the book, I would press more into the philosophy of science. What I took for granted was that um, this idea that science and religion are opposed, um, you know, the, the myth of the conflict between religion and science, that's been heavily debunked by academics. Almost no serious scholar of religion and science thinks that religion and science are in conflict necessarily. But many people who are not specialists in science and technology studies or, or that particular sub-issue seem to assume that they are. And so I just sort of took for granted. I kind of roll over this section pretty quickly where I'm like, oh, yeah, and of course, you know, plenty of people are scientific and religious, and there's no reason to think that those two things cancel each other out. But then in some of the responses to the book, people are like, oh, but doesn't science not just strip away magic, but also kill religion? And isn't science killing God and all this stuff like that? And I and none of that is historically true. It's not an accurate description of, of almost any point in history. Certain particular belig religious beliefs are excluded by particular scientific discoveries, but but both religion and science are too vast and too amorphous things to, to, to be seen in that way. And there are many different strategies that people have historically used to reconcile the two. So I, I wish I, if I had a second edition that I, I could explore that in greater detail. Nice. Well, Jason, I'm a high school religious studies teacher, and one of my favorite things to do in my classrooms is have guest speakers. And I feel like I could put you in front of the class and just have you just talk about pretty much anything, and I think that it would just blow all their minds. Oh, um, thanks. So at the end of discussions, uh, I would sometimes ask a speaker like what the biggest takeaway they wish all students would leave the conversation having retained. And we have talked about so many things so far. What is the biggest thing that you would want listeners to retain or take away from either this conversation or your work in general? 
Oh man. Okay. Uh, woo. I know. Because, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, like, I'm gonna name a bunch of things. Yeah, so that's fine. I'll, I'll just. So first, um, a number of the most influential theorists in philosophy and the social sciences. Uh, everybody from Charles Taylor to Max Weber to uh, contemporary to Charles Long, people in Afro pessimism, people in sociology, people in critical theory, Frankfurt School. All these people have argued that the defining feature of modernity is that people is disenchantment that what makes the modern world modern is that people in the industrialized west no longer believe in ghost spirits occult forces or magic i mean they define it differently but that's usually what they think in that uh, they capture in that category of disenchantment and i want to argue that they're wrong so in in the biggest bottom line i'm trying to push back against a huge body of theory and i have a lot of evidence to do it but i'm trying to push back against that a second point is that you know this this is disproved because in part because people believe in magic and spirits uh, all over the majority of people do so in, uh, in Europe and North America and and they do so all over the globe and I don't want to say that these are atavisms they're not it's not the case that these are holdovers it's not that their the beliefs are unchanged the definition and nature and notion of ghosts for example has changed a lot over the last few hundred years but um, the other thing another couple points just to keep throwing these out here despite the association between Nazis and the occult, I want to say that the paranormal or, or enchanted belief can be found on both sides of the political aisle, typically in different forms. So don't just assume that because, um, I don't know, Isaac Newton believed in alchemy, he was on some particular point in the political spectrum or what have you, or some contemporary person believes it doesn't mean they're, anything about their politics necessarily. Also, people have often thought that the human sciences, the humanities and social sciences, came about because of the rejection of magic and theology. But it turns out that many of Europe's greatest thinkers – Max Weber, Freud, Wittgenstein, Schopenhauer, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, to name a few, were, comp were profoundly enmeshed in the occult milieu and, and believed in many of these complex phenomena. The other thing is, some of the people who promoted the description of modernity as disenchanted were themselves occultists or magicians who aimed to resupply the West with the missing magic. So Crowley also thought magic had declined. He thought it was gone, and that's why he thought he had to bring it back. The same thing for, for Helena Blavatsky. All over the place, it's not just people who want magic to go away who describe the modern West as disenchanted. They're people who, who want to bring it back who describe it as disenchanted. Also, two more, maybe two more points. Sure. Um, Disenchantment is not the same thing as secularization. There's been a round of critiques of the old-fashioned secularization theory that, that sees – uh, con modern history in terms of the decline of religious influence. I'm not, I, I don't want to say secularization did or didn't happen. There are ways in which secularization looks like it happened perhaps in Western Europe, and you can define secularization as Charles Taylor does in ways that make it happen in the, in the modern West as well. But the oddity is that that disenchantment and secularization have to be unlinked. So, you know, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, the de-Christianization de doesn't mean that people are becoming ra super rational atheists. It means often that people are going to their Ouija boards or uh, are becoming believers in psychic powers or spirits or what have you. And again, I don't want to fault anybody for their beliefs, but that's just not a description that makes any sense. So finally, the West is not as different from the rest of the world as it often pretends to be. In a way, my book is an attempt to do kind of post-colonial theory. I'm trying to say that there's this grand story about how rational Europe was that is basically a myth and how irrational the rest or mysterious the rest of the world is that's basically a myth. So in part, what I want to say is that people are kind of people and, and, and in a complex way. Um, not in a way that universalizes a certain set of values or beliefs, but uh, or, or yeah, but a way in which describes kind of rationality and notes that in terms of at least the axis of, of disenchantment and enchantment, the globe looks pretty similar. Cool. Well, I know that you're working on a new book, too, uh, yeah. ten tentatively titled Metamodernism, the Future of Theory After Postmodernism. And the description that you have so far is this. It uses insights from science studies, feminist new materialism, Japanese philosophy, and both continental and analytic philosophy, especially the philosophy of science, to address one of the central impasses of the discipline of religious studies, the disintegration of its central term, religion. So it articulates new methods for the social sciences by simultaneously radicalizing and moving past the postmodern turn. What can readers expect from this book, Jason? 
Yeah. Oh, that's I, I, I was just listening to you because that's a, an old description that I realized is on my Web page and I should change slightly. But uh, I'll forget that for a second. Um, <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to lead a revolution in the humanities and social sciences. That's the easiest way to put it. I think that the way we've been doing our basic operating methods uh, have run aground. And I want to say they've run aground in, in two different ways. On the one hand, for a long time, um, you know, when I was an undergraduate and, and up until a, a little while ago, um, much of the humanities and social sciences got caught up in something that we could call postmodernism. Uh, uh, they got really interested in wordplay. Uh, they got really interested in certain kinds of skepticism. A lot of that was good, and, and I come out of a milieu in which I've been quite well trained in that stuff. But it, it, but basically, you can deconstruct everything, and then all you're doing is repeating the act of deconstruction endlessly, and you're not going anywhere. A backlash against that has been an anti-theory thing, where people are like, oh, we don't need to have theories. We just study the facts or whatever. We just present truth. And that turns out to be a mess. You can't do, uh, there aren't any facts except the ones that you can produce or describe according to certain theoretical frameworks. So I'm trying to do something that, um, in a way, takes us ra takes us past postmodernism by radicalizing it. So by granting some of its foundational assumptions, by complicating others, and I'm trying to push us into a whole new way of thinking about the study of um, the humanities and social sciences, what we should do, why should we be doing them, what methods and techniques should we use to describe them. For example, how are things socially constructed? You know, take a step back. People would say, for example, that things are either socially constructed or real, and that's a mistake, right? But because I want to say that there are certain things that are both socially constructed and real, and then I want to go beyond that and say, and how are they socially constructed? Um, and I think we can theorize about that or... You know, anyway, so what the project is, is it's a kind of grand reevaluation of some of the intellectual history of the humanities and social sciences. It's a crazy, ambitious book. I'm reading theory from all over the place. And what it produces is both uh, a new argument about how we should do scholarship, but also a new set of goals that we might want to have in mind when we do scholarship. And then finally, like a new way of thinking about knowledge as such, or, or at least um, a way of thinking about fallible, limited, humble knowledge. So, I mean, yeah, it's a big project. And I guess I'm a little caught up in it because that's what I was working on this morning. Nice. I'm hoping to, hoping to have a the, the draft should be done by the end of the summer and it should come out either next year or early 2021. Um, but it's a big attempt to kind of reevaluate what we mean by theory. Cool. Is that going to be University of Chicago again for the prop for the publisher? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, wow, Jason, I am uh, just delighted to have you on this show today. I mean, this has just been such a fun conversation for me. This book is so like big and amazing. And there's so many overlooked pieces of history about some of history's most important people in it. And Thanks. I have just been loving it, um, sir. So, I mean, this is just great stuff. Uh, where can people find you if they want to follow your past, present and future work? Uh, so the best first starting place is my professional webpage, which is on the Williams College website. And if you just Google Jason Josephson Storm, you'll find it. It's um, um, uh, on the off of the Williams.edu webpage. I also have a blog, um, absolute-disruption.com. I haven't posted much on it uh, since I've been working on my current book project, but there are little tidbits and nuggets uh, on that. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. Um, and then if you, for some reason, want to listen to my DJing, yes. uh, you can you can Google DJ Jason Danger or type that into um, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, I think it sh should still be up there. The podcast is called Transnational Underground. Um, but yeah, basically, my my professional webpage is probably the best thing. I use Twitter kind of sparingly or, you know, in, for certain kinds of professional dialogue, and I don't totally love it. Um, but I, I like to blog. And uh, but you can find a link to my blog and everything else on my professional webpage. Well, fantastic. So we've had a really good time talking about the myth of disenchantment, magic, modernity, and the birth of the human sciences. There's a lot more work that you are apparently bringing out in, into the world very soon. Um, and I look forward to potentially having you back on the show again to uh, talk about um, uh, metamodernism, the next book. That'd be great. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And I hope your listeners enjoy. Thank you very much. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. 
Thanks so much for listening.